Hello again. So today we have the first panel of the day here in the Tropical Sunset Scenario. So I'm very happy to introduce you to Adrian Sutton, Oshin Kain, Paul Hauner, and Vasily Shapovalov. Woo. Woo. <laughs> yeah, they are going to talk about it's 10 p.m. Do you know where your mnemonic is? <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. As some of you that can count might notice, we're one short and a panelist, but uh, I think he'll join us um, momentarily. So I think we'll more or less kind of kick off and do a bit of intros and stuff beforehand. Um, oh, there's the man himself, Vasily. Uh, OK. Um, so probably with slides. Sweet. So today we have a panel on um, valid air mnemonics and their, pa and their security. Uh, it's been almost two years since the beacon chain launched, and there's quite a lot of people that haven't touched those private keys in quite a long time. Um, over the course of the next 50 minutes, we're going to look back at you know, what's been done on the key security side for the last while. We're going to see what things are looking like right now in terms of validator key security, and then we're going to look a bit forward towards withdrawals, which I'm sure lots of people want to know about. But before we get to that, I would like to do a few introductions. Uh, will this going to work for me? Probably not. OK. Arrow it is. Um, oh, yeah, now it's connected. Sweet. So briefly, I'll introduce myself. My name is Oshin Kain. I'm co-founder at Obol Labs. We build distributed validator technology, which is the ability to run one validator across multiple machines by multiple entities. Um, and yeah, uh, that's my little quick intro. Um, I'd like to introduce Paul next. Hello, uh, my name is Paul, co-founder of Sigma Prime. Uh, I've been working on uh, Lighthouse, which is an Ethereum consensus implementation since 2018. Um, yeah, I've done a lot of the initial development of it, and now I do a lot of kind of overseeing and reviewing, uh, and still some development. I'll pass it on to Adrian. Hi, I'm Adrian Sutton. I'm with Consensus, and I started out on the BASU team doing the execution layer side before there was an idea of a consensus layer side. Uh, spent about a year and a half pretty much full time on Beisu and then switched over to Teku because I heard that Beacon Chain was the new hotness uh, and Teku is a consensus client so I've uh, spent the last, oh I don't know, three to four years uh, helping build that and bring the merge to fruition. It's been a lot of fun, been working with people like Paul and, and a lot of fun there. Um, so yeah, and Vasily. Hey, um, I'm Vasily, tech lead at Lido also which is probably more relevant to uh, to this panel, I used to be CTO in a P2P validator, uh, so I know a thing to do about uh, managing keys for validation. So, sweet, uh, awesome. So we're gonna like test that and, and figure out some of the good, bad, and ugly about managing uh, private keys. Um, so yeah, so the first thing I want to do is look back a little about how it started and figure out you know some of the basics about what is a mnemonic and stuff. So I thought, Paul, would you explain to us what a mnemonic is? Oh yeah, sure, so uh, I'm not sure I can get a textbook definition, but a mnemonic is a series of words, a phrase, um, say 20, 12 to 24, variable length. I think it's, I think 24 is the standard in, in, in F2. So a bunch of words, easy to remember, supposedly. Um, and then from those words, you can, ge you can generate um, any number of uh, validator keys. So there'd be signing keys or withdrawal keys. So the premise is that um, once you generate this um, string of words, uh, then you write those string of words down on a piece of paper, uh, and then um, you use those words to generate your validator keys, and you put those validator keys on, uh, on, on some hardware, on, on your hot machines, um, and then you only keep a copy of the mnemonic um, on paper um, so that, yeah, so that in the future, if those keys were to be, like if those boxes exploded, disappeared, you could use the, that mnemonic to generate exactly the same keys again. Beat. Thank you very much. And I wanted to dig in a little bit. Uh, you mentioned withdrawal keys and hot keys. I was wondering, Adrian, could you tell me the difference between them? And do they have to have the same seed phrase? Uh, yeah, so the, the hot keys that we talk about are your validator keys. And they're the ones that you will have used and seen so far um, in dealing with Ethereum and, and if you're running a validator. So they're the ones that are on your node. And your, your validator client has to actually load them into memory. 
any kind of secret key that's loaded into memory and hot on a machine is not as secure as something that's locked up in a safe. Um, so they're at a higher risk of, of being stolen. You still do your best to, to secure them and, and secure the machine, obviously. Um, but we wanted to make sure that there's a, a big difference between those hot keys that, that run your validator and sign things and the keys that actually control the money and, and whether you can re withdraw it. So from your mnemonic, uh, by default, you would generate a validator key using one path. And as Paul said, you can generate multiple keys. So from a different path, you get a separate validator key. Uh, and, and it's that validator key that you will use once withdrawals are implemented to set up withdrawals and be able to, to actually re recover your money again. Do they have to come from the same mnemonic? No, they don't. Um, you don't even have to use a mnemonic. You can just generate the keys directly um, without going through the mnemonic process. But typically, uh, it's a lot easier to back up one mnemonic and not lose it and etch it into steel or whatever it is and, and store it in a safe well than to have multiple keys that are you know, being managed and, and able to be lost. Because if you lose your withdrawal key, that's it. It's game over. You're not getting your 32 ETH back. Yeah, that's kind of one of the things we're going to get to uh, a bit further on. So, as you mentioned in the seed phrase thing, um, a lot of people that are home staker would have used the ETH2 staking CLI. That set up, you know, one 24-word mnemonic that had both your withdrawal keys and your hot keys. Um, it, it's unfortunate we were supposed to have one more panelist, Jim McDonald, and he's done a lot of work in this specific problem. But uh, the reason that this t thing is titled, it's 10 p.m., do you know where your mnemonic is? is because some unfortunate people have had these mnemonics compromised over the last two years. And I was wondering if any of you guys wanted to kind of explain what uh, Jim's proposal is for, for how we kind of straighten this out. But yeah, what is what is the problem if somebody has your mnemonic? Uh, so basically, if uh, you used the, East, uh, the, the same mnemonic to generate the validator key and withdrawal key, uh, withdrawal credentials, um, which is most home stakers users, but it's um, um, much less often happening for uh, big corporations, uh, where it's usually different keys owned by different people. So if it's the same, the same mnemonic was used, or like what is going to happen uh, is that now the um, the malicious uh, person who compromised the key, they can. Um, like you are in a race of to who can slash the protocol, like slash your validator first, which is if your small validator is not like really a big problem. You stop validation, you get very small fine uh, slash slash penalty, and it's not that old. But withdrawal key compromised means that they can um, uh, when when the validator exits and withdrawals implemented in Ethereum and protocol upgrades allows to uh, either to get back to execution layer. They, you are in a race to understand who gets the money, and yep. if you're more stake, you probably lose the race uh, versus like a craft, like crafty adversary. Sweet. We'll uh, follow up a bit more about that later on in the talk. But I wanted to ask you a bit about Lido Vasily and specifically the withdrawal key setup you guys used at Genesis. So not the most recent one. Could you tell me a bit about like how Lido originally set up with withdrawal keys? Uh, yeah, uh, long story short, uh, the initial, I think, about like 15 or 20% of stake that Lido has, has been uh, deposited on a threshold uh, signature uh, on, on uh, 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 0x0 type, uh, if I'm uh, being exact for, for people who know. Basically, uh, um, sharded credentials that are shared between uh, 11 people uh, very well known in the industry who when the time comes when the role is implemented and the rotation of withdrawal credentials implemented uh, they can issue a command to rotate it though to the uh, Lido smart contract address Sweet. Uh, yeah that was like we we coded it for half a year and uh, uh, we <laughs> we've had a couple audits on it so like it, it was like hard to make uh, because at the time there were no smart contract uh, or like even execution layer credentials option for uh, for the posits thank, thank you for teeing me up for my next question which is to talk a little bit about where things went wrong with the ox0 ones and there was like basically well 
there's your hotkeys and your withdrawal keys, and there's like two different ones I wanted to touch on where there were problems. The first one is stake.us and the hotkey issue. Does anyone explain what happened? It's quite a while ago, it was nearly two, two years. Um, there were 175 validators slashed because they were running the hotkeys in two different places. You might know the details and I can yeah, provide yeah, some Yeah, I've, I've read the post-mortem. It's, like it's quite, sim uh, quite, quite simple to understand. So Stakeit is a big, sophisticated node operator. Uh, they, they run, uh, like I think, uh, maybe billions, maybe hundreds of millions of stake, a lot of them. And they have sophisticated setups. So like one of the, the features they used in, in multiple protocols was they uh, had implemented something like, like an, uh, something that in traditional world would be called like web application firewall. So basically they implemented software that ran between the node and the network, and it should have catched, uh, caught the, the double sign events. And they implemented for, as far as I understand, for multiple blockchains, including Ethereum and put, up, uh, put it up um, uh, for, for the Ethereum validation uh, uh, setup and ran multiple uh, versions of the nodes uh, with, like, with the same private key that uh, were making blocks in parallel and this was usually caught by the, uh, the system. Um, I'm I'm not like 100% sure of that because otherwise it could be it could have been that they accidentally deployed it like uh, to 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 things in parallel not not like the as the usual setup but anyway they did uh, uh, they did have a, uh, an automated system for liveness that uh, at times could have run multiple validators with the same private key which is uh, usually uh, lead to slashable offense in in protocols uh, including Ethereum and uh, they had a system to uh, that should have caught the the problems, which is like usually uh, people don't do that, like right um, in, in in not operator setup because uh, liveness is not as important as safety. Uh, slashing for for lack of uh, for so for for missing a few blocks are much 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 lesser than uh, slashing like the penalties for for double sign. It's like not worth it usually. Yeah. Um, so. Um, that system didn't work, and uh, they, for about like 40 minutes or like about an hour, they had issued blocks in parallel, and they were like really lucky that the Ethereum system is designed like it's designed because like they had uh, I think about 70 million dollars staked or something like that at this time, uh, and they only slashed uh, like 15 validators or like or 27. I don't like really like rookie numbers, right? <laughs> so, um, and that's uh, the case because um, not, not a lot of validators had uh, had issued the invalid blocks or attestations because um, it's not uh, like you, you don't uh, run the your stake on a single node like in many other systems. Otherwise they would have like 5% slash or like 15% slash, which is like much, much higher. Yeah. And uh, uh, only after that, the uh, uh, monitoring and alerting system had triggers, so like they they ran this uh, with this problem for a long time. So there had been some problems in there as well. I think initially you described the setup as sophisticated. I think that was a very kind way to refer to it. I would I would call it dangerously overcomplicated. But yeah, I, I agree. I think that these setups where you're running multiple instances of the same key in any place, I think you you really, like Vesely said, you're just prioritizing liveness over um, safety and it's, it's, I think it's really bad business. It's not, it's not good economically. Um, it's really bad for your reputation uh, and it's bad for the network as well. So I really could, couldn't advise against it any stronger. Yeah, probably the interesting thing, particularly pre-merge, I think it's probably a little less likely post-merge now, but pre-merge, you could run validator keys in two places and get away with it for a surprising amount of time until you proposed a block or until your node was just slightly out of sync or you just got that little bit unlucky. Because both validators, if you're staying in sync and are testing perfectly, they'll create the exact same attestation and that's not slashable. So it's incredibly dangerous and you think you're okay for quite a while until one day you wake up and you've lost all your money. Um, or, well, you, know, you don't lose it all. Just, but just a bit of money actually because of how it didn't work, so yeah. Yeah, I know, but particularly, you know, it's. With no withdrawals not implemented, it really must be frustrating to have been slashed early on in the chain and still be waiting to get your money back out. Yeah. 
For sure. And then, as you mentioned, slashing, you don't lose all your money. But as we touched on earlier, if there's problems with withdrawal keys, you can be like really in trouble. There was one other very famous issue about two years ago as well by Stakehound. Does anyone remember what happened there with their withdrawal keys? I had to go look this up myself beforehand. Yeah, you might have to give me the background. I remember stories no. and not names. <laughs> oh, um, I, I also know exactly what happened. <laughs> yeah, I, I read all the passmotors, so yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so uh, the thing is, uh, Stakehound, together with Fireblocks, uh, has designed a system not unlike the one that LIDAR designed, with threshold signature used for holding keys, except it was like mm, much smaller. I think they only had like three or four signatures, out of which two, sign two, two shards was in possession of Stakehound and two shards were possession of Fireblocks. And uh, um, Nobody knows what exactly happened uh, because, like, the the parties have like different interpretation of what happened. But what we end like what they end up in situation when the two shares that stake count was supposed to hold were not held by stake count, and that could have happened. Like we don't know why that happened. Like maybe it was like problem on the software side. Maybe it was problem on stake count side on communications on like uh, wrong backups system. Like that's buried in lawsuits. I think right now so. Um, uh, not sure about that, but the end result is uh, all that stake uh, about 72 million by I think 38,000 either. Yeah, yeah, 600 uh, dollars per head or something like that. Um, I didn't check if it's operating still or not. Like, if, if the I think it's operating still because uh, like there can be a miracle. Uh, I don't know. Uh, someone you can always find get transaction rewards now. Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> some, some, some kind of like chance that you find like an old mnemonic in the old uh, um, jacket or something, right? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but uh, it's essentially unwithdrawable right now. So this is how you wind up with your CEO sifting through the dump, looking for... <laughs> <laughs> Quite possibly, or yeah, going through like any old bit of hardware they can find. Um, but yeah, thank you very much, Vasily, for giving those descriptions and preventing me from having to do it. But yeah, I think we don't necessarily know, you know, what happened, but what we do know is that if anything happens to your withdrawal key, odds are very high that there's nothing you can do. Um, so with that in mind, Genesis happened in December 2020, and about six months later or so, there was a change to withdrawal credentials. They introduced the idea of um, what we know as 0x01 type withdrawal credentials. And does anyone want to explain what they are? Yeah, actually, no, that one, that's good. Um, so the 0x01 withdrawal credentials were introduced because we realized uh, that the way we were going to merge and, and move forward with Ethereum 2 uh, was different to what we first expected. So we set up these uh, 0x00 keys as BLS keys, matching what validators have, um, partly with the expectation of all Ethereum addresses becoming BLS keys, and partly just didn't really know what it was going to be, so we went with the tech we had. Um, with the plans for the merge, keeping the execution layer and keeping the traditional Ethereum addresses, uh, we introduced OX01 addresses, which are just an Ethereum public address. So it's a whole bunch of zeros and then the 20 bytes of, of a normal Ethereum address. And the guarantee is that when withdrawals are implemented and uh, your money comes off the beacon chain, it will be credited to that address. Um, the catch with it is a, is a minor one, but important depending on how you write your contracts. If you, you can use any Ethereum address, um, it can be a contract, but the EVM will not execute when funds are added to that. So if you're expecting log events to come out, they won't, you won't have that opportunity. Um, you need to write the contract in a way that it can kind of just handle being called one day and there being more money in its account than it previously saw. And dole that out and however it wants from there. Sweet. And then Lido, when this came out, um, very quickly adopted it. Could you tell me a bit about, you know, what that process was like, the risk of writing a contract for something that doesn't exist yet? Uh, how did that kind of process go and, and the kind of migration, you might say? Well, there's no migration, but the swap out. Uh, yeah, so it wasn't too hard, actually. Like, uh, it's like we have done a stop that is governance controlled and that stop will be uh, like sometimes like in the future when withdrawals are implemented it will be upgraded and when the Ethereum ossifies uh, enough um, it will be uh, uh, made unupgradable um, so it ossifies as well um, 
so there is like nothing uh, complicated about this, like just a smart contract that that is a stuff that does nothing except being upgraded. Implementing withdrawals, uh, handling withdrawals, due to the fact that like you can't know when, uh, like you you're not getting triggered when uh, other comes in, is a, is like is harder. Uh, the Ethereum staking protocol is pretty complex, and we when you add the liquidity like liquid staking protocol uh, complexness on top of it, uh, it's um, it's pretty hard research to to do it just right, but uh, we'll manage so. Sweet, sweet. Yeah, uh, you make it sound very easy, but I'm not so sure that uh, writing like a proxy smart contract holding, I don't know, $10 billion is super easy. Is that about right, number-wise? Like it's not harder than uh, writing a contract that holds zero, uh, <laughs> like, right? It's just like the stakes are higher. Yeah, if you get it wrong, it can be a contract that has zero very quickly. <laughs> oh. Sweet. At, at some moment, you'll just become dead inside, like when you walk the history. So <laughs> I used to be a CTO for a validator. Like I had like, well incidents in a year, so. <laughs> yeah, um, sweet. There's one other withdrawal credential that isn't necessarily in the spec yet, and that's 0x03. Does anyone want to talk about what that uh, withdrawal credential is? I don't know what that is. <laughs> I, I, think, I think you're probably keen on this, but the OX03 <laughs> is designed to be a forced withdrawal. So at the moment, um, you actually wind up needing both your hotkey and your withdrawal key effectively to, to get through the full withdrawal process. Because while your validator is active, your 32 ETH is, remains locked up, you need to exit your validator and then it can go through the withdrawal process and that's where the withdrawal key comes in. If, however, you're uh, staking, so you're not staking yourself, you've asked someone else to stake on your behalf and you've given them your hotkeys knowing that they can't steal your ETH because you've got the withdrawal keys, not a bad setup. Um, you have one little problem in that you can't force them to exit your validator and actually get your ETH back. And so the OX03 credentials are intended um, to be a, a way of the withdrawal credentials being able to force exit a validator effectively. Um, I don't know if you know the details of how that was planned. Uh, so, like, uh, there is no more details because, like, it's all drafts. But I think that zero x x zero three credentials are completely unnecessary. That just a feature that can be added to zero x one, like the same way um, handled this much the same way as deposits to be contained are handled. Like, just like consensus layer processing messages from execution layer, and it's not even too hard. It's just like needs to be designed and implemented, tested. We are actually working on it right now on design. Uh, I don't think it'll, it can make uh, it into Shanghai. I'm like, that's probably unrealistic, but like the next hunt after Shanghai is like doable, I think. It, the, the interesting trade-off as a client, Dev, and, and designing some of these protocols when we're talking about withdrawal processes is trying to be fair with who controls which key and therefore what response, what rights they have. Um, so we've kind of set up this idea that the money will go to whoever has the withdrawal key um, and the signing key is in control of actual signing and exit. And as every time we go and change that, you wind up with a whole bunch of people in quite unique situations that were built around that particular split of responsibilities. And when you change the split, you've got to kind of make sure that you don't break things for other people or introduce insecurities because of this particular way they've set things up. I personally don't know anyone who built around uh, that like assumption. So like uh, who is actually relying on the fact that validators can exit and withdrawals cannot? I, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I think that's a fairly reasonable one that, uh, you know, the, the base assumption is that you, you are, you know, it's your money, so it's your validator and you own all the keys. Um, when you start to, move away from that into um, staking providers and so on, you are moving out of the, I guess, ideal case. Um, you know, that, there is a role for staking providers. I don't mean that as in, you know, <laughs> this horrible person on my right or anything. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, but, you know, it does, it does, the onus is almost on people doing that to, to help with the security and manage it rather than on the protocol itself because it's based around that one key, one validator type setup. Um, so yeah, I think I think it's quite reasonable to make a lot of these changes, and and we can kind of push those boundaries. 
a lot of the, the actual expectations haven't been really formally and strictly set down either. Um, we've kind of given a, an expectation in many cases, but knowing that we didn't have actually a plan for withdrawals when we set most of them, we knew there were going to have to be changes. And so there are kind of some really core things maybe that we've got to keep that, you know, like the money goes to the withdrawal key, not the signing key. It will never be the signing key that gets the money. Um, but beyond that, yeah, there's, there's a lot of wiggle room we do have. I, I had a similar concern. I didn't mention my background, but I also like previously ran quite a large validator and ran maybe 10,000 plus validators. And uh, at one point when they were discussing this, you know, new 0x01 withdrawal type, and, you know, that would be the way that ultimately like money will come out. If you are on the OX01, you'll need to like swap eventually before you can withdraw. There was a, a moment where that was going to be the hotkey that gets to pick where the new OX01 one was. And I was quite concerned because all of a sudden that meant I was in charge of billions of dollars for a, previous, a small amount of time. And then they were like, okay, no, let's make the withdrawal key make that change. And I think that's uh, definitely for the better. But uh, on that one, I do have a question for the two client devs. When it comes to, like, I don't want to say keeping people happy, but whenever like, people have requests of how to build staking, are you always focused on the home staker? Are you always focused on enterprise liquid staking pool? Does often come into conflict? Like, who, who are you keeping happy and, and who are you disappointing? <laughs> Paul? <laughs> I think Adrian expressed um, a little bit of that sentiment in his previous one. Um, uh, it, it's, it's different for everyone, I think. I can't speak for all the client devs. I can't even speak for my entire team. I can speak for myself. Um, I like to prioritize the home staker, I think. I think that's kind of the base instance, if you know what I mean, where kind of all other features are uh, kind of supersets of that. Um, and I also think it sticks with the Ethereum ethos of decentralization as well. Um, but so I, I would say that making decisions that put the home staker in an uncomfortable position is probably almost always out of the question if it's if it's to benefit the institutional staker. Um, but I would say the other scenario where if we need to benefit the home staker and it's gonna it's gonna cause troubles for the institutional staker, I would probably be more open to doing that just because I have more resources. There's fewer of them. Um, so ideally, we always want to support everyone. We don't want to just like you know do things to like to disadvantage institu institutional stakers just because we can. But my personal preference is for the for the little guy. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, a part of that, and almost probably underlying that, um, is that it tends to be Ethereum that comes first, and and those core principles. So Aya's talk this morning was really good in terms of talking about some of those principles behind Ethereum and and. Decentralization is a key part of that, and so that's why I tend to agree with the home staker tends to come first. They don't have someone advocating for them, and they're the most decentralized form of validation. Um, so yeah, I, it does mean that that there are sometimes those hard decisions that a lot of people would say, you know, it'd be really nice to stake with less ETH, or it'd be really nice to whatever it is, and you look at it and go, but that's really going to hurt the protocol. Like it's going to cause too much system requirements and hurt decentralization or it's whatever it is, it's going to reduce security or so on, um, enable more capture of different things. Those kind of principles mean that we won't always make anyone happy um, <laughs> because it's actually about making Ethereum work well and work well for the long term. Mm, yeah, uh, to, to add to that, uh, from my experience, uh, the only one feature that uh, was uh, uh, like for big operators uh, and not for home stakers was uh, actually an advanced key management practices. And uh, like we talked about with Sigma Prime about that, I think uh, in uh, before before Ethereum uh, made it to become chain like start. Uh, and that was like pretty unambiguous feature. Like I, I, I don't remember like even one case where this interest was uh, in, in opposite, right? If home stakers can run the node like operate big operators can run the node, and all we want is like good practice of key uh, key management. And for that, the only thing that is needed is a good uh, standard of uh, remote signer. So like remote signers can be written up, uh, like coded up independently. And that's the only feature that I, I can think of that is like not usually used by home stakers, but almost always used by uh, big operators. So that's it, I think. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Most of the decisions we have to make are uh, good for everyone, and you know, it works out pretty well. The, the 
external signer is a really interesting one because it wound up with a niche. It's been used by a number of systems, including Dapnode, to make it easy to swap clients. So you put your keys into the external signer and it holds them and your slashing protection and then you can change your validated client and beacon node all you like without ever moving your keys. Uh, so home stakers have wound up adopting this technology that was really first built for, for the big staking providers and that's kind of cool. Yeah, the one thing you're describing in terms of where the protocol was changed to favor the, li the home stakers versus the like uh, enterprises was probably with MEV boost and blinded beacon blocks. Um, this one, you know, is one that we're probably seeing a lot of people kind of giving out about now, but I think a lot of people don't consider the counterfactual, which was if these were plain text blocks, MEV boost and might not be like given to home stakers. And the fear was that if they were excluded from MEV, um, it would like massively impact their reward and would massively harm them. So, you know, we now have this world where people are giving out about like, you know, centralized relay or censoring. And that was kind of the trade off of going for the blinded blocks and stuff. But yeah, it, it's definitely a tricky one. And I, I sometimes I'm grateful that I can just ask tricky questions, don't have to actually answer them most of the time. <laughs> um, so the next thing I wanted to do a little was look a bit forward on kind of where we're going next in terms of withdrawals. Um, so we talked a lot about like the like withdrawal credentials, but we haven't really talked much about how it's going to happen, you might say. And I'm going to try and not ask like when withdrawals, but can I ask um, how the withdrawal spec has changed over the last six months? We started with kind of a pull-based system, and now we're at like push. Do Adrian, Paul, do you want to like talk about why they swapped? Uh, yeah, I didn't follow it a whole lot um, whilst whilst in in the previous uh, pull method, but I do know how the push method works now, um, and I think it is a lot simpler. So the method that's going to happen now, well, not going to happen, but it looks like it's going to happen, um, is a system where the beacon chain. Uh, automatically without user input will scan through the validators and look for validators that are fully withdrawable, withdrawn, um, and then it'll just pull their ETH out and then put it on the, the execution chain. Um, and it'll also look for validators who have excess balance above 32 F and then just pull that excess balance out and put it on the execution chain. So this is um, kind of, so it's, it's, it's an automatic process where uh, you don't need to go and withdraw ETH, you just kind of end up with money in the smart contract, which I think is really, really nice. I think it's really good for users because um, it means they're signing less weird messages. I know anyone who runs a validator could probably um, empathize, but the idea of having to go and touch the keys on my validator client or do something with my validator client apart from just leaving it alone, it's just terrifying and it's horrible. Um, so I think it's really good to be able to just like have it happen automatically. Um, yeah, there's going to be, I don't know if I, uh, so there's, there's, there's going to be a complication though and it, and it kind of, it goes around these um, two types of um, withdrawal keys we have. So it's been mentioned there's the 0x00 keys, which is a BLS withdrawal key um, and then which was the, well, like Adrian said, we did that in the early days because we didn't know what we were going to do. Uh, and then there's the 0x01 where we um, don't have a BLS key, we just have an Ethereum address. Um, so if you're on a 0x01 Ethereum address, then this automatic withdrawal system is, gonna, is just going to work for you. It's just like when the hard fork happens, you're going to start getting some, some fresh ETH. Um, but if you're with the BLS keys, what you're going to have to do is go and dig up your withdrawal keys from wherever you put it. Um, and then you're going to need to use some sort of tooling um, to sign a message um, to say, okay, I'm now moving away from this BLS key that, that I'm proving that I have, and I'm switching over to an Ethereum address, 0x01 type, and then the automatic withdrawals can kick in. Um, so yeah, I think it's a shame that we have to do this. We have to make, I would say, most users um, go and sign this message, um, but uh, I think it's unavoidable. But then after that, um, it'll all kind of happen automatically. So. Knowing that that is very much in the pipeline and looking like it's going to happen, where I know Lighthouse is starting to implement it, I think Deku is, it, lots of the clients are keen on it. Um, I would say if you're creating a new validator today, uh, I would be using 0x01. I would be using an ETH address. Um, I think it's going to make your life a lot easier. Um, and I think just managing, I think managing Ethereum addresses is much easier uh, than managing BLS keys just because we've already got trezors and everyone's familiar with it. Yeah, one really important point is that once you have switched to an OX01 key, so once you've got an Ethereum address, whether you started with it or whether you switched through this new system, that's it. 
you can't change it again. Um, and there's concerns around that because people want to change it, but generally the reason you'd want to change it is because you've gone and lost the key to that or you've typed in the wrong address or something. Don't make that mistake. It's like transferring money to that address, right? It's gone. There is no way to get it back if you don't control the key uh, because, as we talked about before, it's the withdrawal key that has to own the money. So if you tell us that OX 0000, the null address, owns your ETH, well, now it does. Um, and you're not going to get it back. And there's really very little we can do about that. Well, there's nothing we can do about that. <laughs> For sure. I think um, we're going to see a lot of work. And there was actually a talk by a test and just briefly beforehand where it's now that we can have like Solidity contract addresses, you can program your like change of ownership in there and not like at, with some cryptography or any sort of like multi-sig or anything too weird. Yeah, and that's absolutely a big part of the reason that we've gone with such a simple approach to withdrawals. We don't need to do anything fancy on the consensus layer side because you've now got the full power of the EVM um, to, to work with things and, and have upgradable contracts or split contracts or all kinds of things there um, that let you have this behavior. So think hard about what address you set as your withdrawal address. I would say for most home stakers, it should be something like from your trace or you know, your hardware wallet that, that is very safe and very secure and simple. Keep it simple. You don't need to do anything fancy. And then you know, staking providers will use something that is a contract and probably upgradable, so they've got some control over it. And then there's a range of people in the middle where you, you think about what your needs are and possibly use a, a very simple contract that could be upgraded but could also just kind of hold the funds and send them to you. For sure, yeah. I think um, the, you've touched on one of the things that will show up over the next few years, and this is the EVM having more control over the consensus layer. Because as you pointed out, right now, you write an address and money will show up, but like no code's going to execute, and that's about it. Um, how do you think that's going to change, and what is the EVM, I don't know, consensus layer API going to look like in three years' time? I'm really hoping it doesn't ever get a say. Um, I'm really hoping this stays a one-way thing from the consensus layer pushing to the Ethereum layer or to the, to the execution layer um, because it's dramatically simpler. Uh, to get the EVM to call out to the consensus layer is a big deal and a really big challenge. We've kind of done it with deposits and it's the worst code in any, any consensus client is tracking those deposits and we want to simplify it now we've merged. Um, but there isn't a generic system for passing messages from the EVM back to the consensus layer, and it's a big deal to try and design it. Yeah, definitely all rights, but reads, hopefully. Uh, I hope that the consensus layer can start to push some information about itself into the EVM so that you can you know, do proofs to beacon state routes, but I'm with Adrian. Um, yeah, I wouldn't, uh, g going the other way is, it would be very painful. For sure, yeah. Definitely don't want to go the other way, but uh, as you said, being able to read things about the consensus layer I think is going to become very important because one of the things that we look at with all of the liquid staking pools is for the last two years, these were two totally separate chains and there was like no information passed. Even still, post-merge, there is still more or less no information being swapped, but all of these pools more or less have oracles to say what's happening over in the consensus layer side. And I want to take the chance maybe to talk to Vasily a little bit about how does exits work for something like Lido? Because you guys are you know, a liquid staking token and you're soon going to be able to offer redemptions for the first time, but the redemption queue is very bandwidth constrained. So how does that work for Lido trying to allow people to exchange their STETH for real ETH at some point you know, in the near future? What's that gonna look like? Yeah, so um, we haven't settled on the final design yet. So what I'm talking about is the walk-in uh, walk progress solution, right? Um, uh, it's almost ready, though, for like presentation and voting in for, for the DAO, etc. Um, but the gist of it, the best solution we can do is to reflect the withdrawal queue in on the execution layer. We like try, like looked at multiple different approaches, like uh, auctions for uh, for the like for the place in the queue, uh, some kind of buffers for withdrawals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it all um, I think is like strictly inferior to allowing people to place the like request to withdraw and we put them in a queue on the uh, beacon chain and withdrawal happens and they get their their withdrawals uh, when they time in the queue passes so uh, that's probably going to be it. 
it's pretty like it's pretty complicated uh, because like there are multiple asynchronous processes happening like the withdrawal requests, the um, Oracle reports about what happens on the beacon chain. Like you said, right? We like the needs information what's happening in the beacon chain, and we can't get in real time. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, imp just impossible, right? So um, Oracle requests, slashings, and slashing side, like we haven't had any uh, in our lifetime in Lido, but like if it happens, it's like 35 days process at least. And somewhere in the middle, it has an uncertain amount of slashing penalty, which no one knows like until it happens how much it is going to be because it's like depends on the amount of slashing that like are accumulated up to this point. So when you combine the, all this asynchronous process and you need to like give people exactly the amount they uh, like they 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 need to get uh, it's uh, becoming a pretty complex protocol. Mm, but in fair weather, it just the same queue as uh, on on consensus layer reflected on execution layer as uh, like basically vouchers for for the place in the queue. Sweet, um, awesome. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I think you're not going to be the only one that's going to have uh, a lot of pain with these withdrawal queues very soon because everyone just thinks withdrawals. No one thinks withdrawal queue and. Um, that actually leads me a bit to the like balance skimming. Um, this is another thing that Jim, our like BIF panelist, is very like uh, in favor of, which is if you don't have any way to take the money above 32 ether that's accumulated, all of the big um, liquid staking protocols will just start to churn their validators, take off the you know three ether off the top, and like set up a new one, and the queues will be like perpetually full because you know why don't you just like go and like kind of skim and, and restake? Um, can anyone tell me a bit about what you know skimming is going to look like because it's also changed a bit in the last few weeks? Yeah, it's a it's a very similar process to to what Paul described in terms of finding of scanning through the validators and just it, it magically happens. It's pushed from the consensus layer. the The key thing is that there will be a limit to the number of validators we scan each epoch to to look for whether you've got money over that thirty two ETH that could be pushed to the execution layer. The reason for that is that we've got to fit it into blocks. Um, and it's like another Ethereum transaction that goes into a block, but we're not charging gas for it. Uh, it just happens, and so we kind of have to have uh, a rate limiting on it um, to make sure that we're not effectively just blowing up our block limit and, and, and execution clients are able to process these, these blocks in a reasonable amount of time. So I think it's something like every two months we get around the validator set, um, but I don't think the numbers are at all set. So, um, yeah, it's... Uh, those numbers in particular are going to go through some research and, and seeing what the impact is on execution clients of this many or that many deposits. Um, but it means that fairly regularly, and it'll be in, in that order of you know, a low number of months, I think, that we're aiming for generally, fairly regularly, whatever you've got over the 32 ETH gets swept to the execution layer. So you start getting your rewards on top of the transaction rewards you're getting when you propose a block now. I was going to say, I think... Um I think it's really good because the idea of a validator, so a validator would say 33 ETH, exiting, taking an ETH, putting 32 back in, is really bad for consensus clients because that extra validator slot, um, they, they cost us. We have to store that validator forever. It's more in RAM. Um, yeah, it's, it's really bad. So, so the ability to, like, to, for people to take their earnings without creating a new validator index is, is really good for the protocol. Yeah, there were, there were certainly a lot of people, Jim, uh, I think leading the charge, being very vocal of you've got to have partial withdrawals before, you know, at the same time as withdrawals. And you know, as, as core devs, we try not to promise things until we're sure, but I, I think all of us knew <laughs> that was absolutely right, and there was no way that we could, could manage the impact on the chain of these churning validators if we didn't have partial withdrawals. There is also an economic aspect of it. Uh, if uh, there were no scheming of rewards, uh, then um, the big corporate, like the, the the big stake controllers, like protocols, uh, exchanges, whales, etc., they would get a lot of leg up against small stakers, because they can afford to compound, and small stakers can't. Like it's it's very hard for them. So um, yeah, it's like it's very uh, right move to uh, make it like skin rewards a uh, thing. Uh, the, the, like the, the slight drawback of this uh, is uh, working against uh, the protocols uh, that uh, like staking protocols because you can't really understand uh, 
if the money uh, you're getting on the withdrawal credentials comes from rewards or comes from unstaking. And you need to know that uh, because like rewards you have to redistribute to stakers and unstaking is like something, like someone is drawing something gone wrong or like mislation happened, or, like you, you need to uh, work on it. Um, but uh, it's anyway uh, much better than the alternative. Yeah, I'll, I'll also echo the, it makes much more sense from the compounding thing, but if someone trying to write like Solidity to keep track of something, you now don't know, was this a very bad slashing or was this a skim? So it is a bit tricky like that. Um, I have just one more question before we go to the audience for a few. So have a think of anything you want to ask the, the panel here. But um, when the Capella hard fork comes in and we have this OX0 to OX1 upgrade, how messy do you think it's going to be? Is it going to be over in two blocks and it's going to be 10 people? Is it going to be 50,000 validators? <laughs> I, I suspect, I mean, uh, probably the majority of validators on the network uh, are BLS credentials that we will need to switch. I don't think there'll be a huge rush. Um, I, I think there'll be you know, the initial burst and very likely what will happen is you will submit it and operation pools in clients will actually be full and it'll probably get dropped from the network and it just won't make it onto chain at all and you'll need to submit it again. So we'll kind of have to work through the, the usability of that because if there is a big rush, it's more than we'll keep in the memory pool basically. Um, but I think generally it will be over time because people have got to get their withdrawal keys out. It's something you should take your time and do safely and not rush in the first instant. Um, and, and once it's done, it's over. So it's, it's fairly, fairly one off. Yeah, I think we'll have to think a lot about the tooling to make it easy for people as well. Um, I know the staking, I was talking to Carl from the EF, Carl Beek, um, and he was saying that it's likely that the staking deposit CLI tool will have the tooling to allow you to do it. Um, and I think it'll be a little bit easier because the staking deposit CLI now kind of like makes a bunch of files for you and then you need to get those files. Um, and that's kind of annoying in my opinion. And I think what now that the APIs have evolved, hopefully what we can do with the staking deposit CLI will like you can just input your mnemonic and then tell it where a beacon node is or even a, like a public node and then just have it publish it out to it like that. Um, but it'll be a little bit scary because you have to touch some crypto stuff but I'm hoping that it'll, it'll it'll be okay, and I think that I think I, I'm keen. I know Adrian would be keen as well to to try and make it nice and smooth for people. Yeah, and and I would expect there'll be an offline option of that as well, so you can generate a file of you know your your switch command, the operation that you can then you know, put on a USB stick, take over to a hot thing, and and then send to a public beacon node. Yeah, you could probably upload it to the file to a web page or something like that. Yeah, very likely. And it's already pre-signed, so it can't be changed. It's not a it's not a risky thing. It's just like you something you move up. Yeah, my estimation is about two hundred thousand validators will like rotate as soon as humanly possible, like as safely possible. Uh, the reason is like I know about Lido, we have about fifty thousand, and every extra second is an extra risk uh, on the on this credential. We don't want to do that. Like. Uh, we want to reload the network, of course, but like as soon as humanly possible, we do it. Um, it's it's very important. And uh, about I think like 150, 200 thousand of operators are uh, on BLS credentials uh, that are managed by exchanges. And these exchanges they want to uh, like to pay their rewards as soon as possible again and like convert it to liquid stake and derivatives for like custodial like. Coinbase does with CBE, so um, that's going to happen also very fast. Like the uh, the protocols and custodian that uh, aggregate user stake, they will and haven't rotated. They will rotate. Like they will rotate as soon as possible because uh, basically uh, BLS zero uh, x zero zero credentials are as useful as a potato. Uh, the only thing <laughs> you can do with them is like exit or rotate and like. That's just not right. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'm aligned there. And I do think everyone will go and upgrade at like a relatively leisurely pace. Um, but the likes of the, the Lidos on the old ones and like I, I built block demons and they're on OXO keys, but the withdrawal keys are totally separate to the like hot keys. So I don't think they're as big a concern. But I unfortunately do think, and there have been people that have been posting on forums like admitting to this, that they have their hot key and their like validating key on the same mnemonic and they left that on their like validator machine or something similar, and that's been compromised. And the problem is, is, is you know, I think there's at least 10, if not a bit more, Jim has probably good data on it. But um, when Capella goes live, for those first couple blocks, 
there will be an awful amount of MEV on the table for, you know, there'll be two people that can...